Let's try this again, YouTube. Round two. Hello, YouTube. Today I'm here with my friend, Armani Talks. He is someone who shares wisdom on Twitter, on YouTube, all about how you can level up your communication skills, your social skills, and your charisma. Recently, I interviewed him, so this is a part two interview, and he was mentioning his book, Wordplay. And afterwards, I was called to order the book on Amazon. I've been reading it currently about a little bit more than halfway through and very much enjoying it. And to my surprise, he reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to interview me on my new book? I like your interviewing Scott style. So here we are. We're here again for part two. How are you doing today, Armani? I'm doing well, Joseph. Thanks. Thank you for accepting and buying the book in the first place, which I appreciate your support. And I'm looking forward to our interview. Yeah. I really like this book. Uh, it struck me that it's something that's very easy to read because you can just read a chapter, maybe a chapter, not a chapter, a story or two before bed. And you really have those tools like embedded in your mind for the next day. That's how I've been using this book currently. And I wanted to commend you on one thing that I noticed about this. First of all, you have a great storytelling style, which I think a lot Thank of people you. know. But another thing is that you don't use a lot of like fancy language. So you're not saying, you're not using like these flourishes of like, you know, the, I don't know, like you're really distilling it, like you said, distilling it down to something that's very simple and easy to read and not trying to use like very fancy jargon. Yeah. I mean, uh, younger me hated writing. That was one of the classes I used to hate all the time because the writers that would get rewarded and get the A pluses were the ones that would get cute with it. They would be like, and here I was walking into this room with the sh sun shining on my face and the darkness radiating from this, all this hoopla. And in my world, I was just like, I walked into the room. But this was uh, typically not something that was rewarded. So once I was writing the book, I wanted to write with the intention where it was extremely simple and easy to understand, where a five-year-old can understand it or a 50-year-old, doesn't matter. I love that because that really makes it more accessible to a lot of people. It makes it easier to read, just more enjoyable, I think, nowadays. I think the fancy stuff can be good in certain contexts, right? Like you could have a fiction book that's like very fantastical and that would be great. But in this context, it's perfect to really make it simple. As uh, Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad says, keep it simple, stupid. Remind me yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And that's what makes uh, that uh, rich dad, poor dad book so influential. He's able to decode a complex topic like money, where there's a lot of different variables, but he's able to distill it in a way where anyone can understand it. That's awesome. It reminds me of Einstein. It says like a true genius can explain it. I'm probably butchering it. And so that a three-year-old or a five-year-old can understand what you're saying. So Exactly. K-I-S-S. -S. It's simple. Silly. I'm feeling the next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, I thought we would jump into this. I've been enjoying this book a lot. I've been enjoying reading it. And it's a unique book. It's different than any book I've ever read before in the, the formatting, the style. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But first, I know I hear a lot of people say, I'm going to write my book one day. I can't wait to write my book. But so few people do it. So I commend you, first of all, for writing this book, which is, I know it's not even your first book. So Armani, what inspired you and what motivated you to write the book, Wordplay? So what motivated me, Joseph, was... For my first book, Level Up Mentality, I wrote it in a way where it was more so a guide, where someone can read it first from beginning to end. And that's what I would recommend, reading it from beginning to end in an order. And then you can just pick and choose whichever chapters work for you. And as I was interacting with different people, different friends that I was close with, a lot of the times I would ask them, when was the last time you read a book? And with a lot of pride, they were like, not in over 10 years, I've read a book. And they're saying this with pride. And the reason that they're saying it with so much confidence is because they know the people to the left and right of them also haven't read a book for plenty of years. So when I was writing wordplay, I wanted it to be short stories predominantly for adults who live a very busy life. And I wanted to make it in a way where there was no excuse, where it's you can't be like, oh, well, it's because I'm too busy. Because as you said earlier, I mean, you're able to get through one to two stories just as you're wrapping up the night. And 
that was one of the predominant focuses as to why I wanted to write this book. And I honestly just wanted to go back to the basics. Nowadays, with all this rich technology that we have, it's easy to forget that short stories were the fundamentals of storytelling as a whole.、Uh, just for a little history lesson,、uh, oral storytellers used to be the thing,、yeah. where before the written language, anything like that, there were central storytellers which would share information. So you know they can't be long-winded talking. Four hours in a story, so they kept it short and concise. So I just wanted to go back to the roots, and that's what I wanted to do with wordplay. Okay, getting back to the fundamentals, the roots, allowing you to exercise that gift of storytelling that you have. Man, I like that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, it's a really easy book to just get those those few tips that you need for that day. And yeah, very much enjoyed that. Why did you choose? So you mentioned short stories. Why did you choose short stories as a format for this book? The reason why short stories is just because,、uh, due to the、uh, busyness that a lot of individuals have in their life, and they're just getting swarmed with more and more content. I believe short stories are machine gun of knowledge for the mind. We're just firing a certain subject in different angles, and wordplay predominantly the theme is regarding communication skills. A few of the topics in communication skills include public speaking, storytelling, social skills, emotional resilience, concentration, etc. And with a short stories, it's sort of like a speedboat where you're capable of taking multiple angles versus a big ship. Or if you want to take a different angle, it requires a lot of work. So what short stories, it, just analogy wise, is to a speedboat. And a novel is to like this one large ship where you don't have as much dynamic angles that you can take. Yeah, I like that analogy. That's a perfect analogy for you know someone from Florida, the speedboat. <laughs>、uh, yeah, I mean there's、uh, there's boats all around us, there's beaches all around us. Yeah. So yeah. Very cool. So short stories. I wanted to ask you, what did you learn about the format of short stories by writing this? I know you write a lot newsletters. You write, have you know newsletter, but what did you learn about The formatting. What are some new things you learned about storytelling from putting this book together? I came to learn that honestly, anything can be turned into a story. And you ever watched Seinfeld growing up? Yes. So you know how Seinfeld became popular because it was a show about nothing. Yet they found a way to make it entertaining, where it was funny. There were episodes like No Soup for You, and they were able to turn extremely regular instances. Into something that was storytelling material.、Um, have you heard of Tyler Perry by any chance? Tyler Perry, yes, the filmmaker. Yes. Yeah. So his process of being so prolific in terms of storytelling is where he's capable of getting just mundane activities in day to day life and asking questions like, "What if? What if? What if?"、Hmm. And by simply constantly asking, "What if this happened instead of this?" That's where he's able to get movie ideas. So as I was writing wordplay, I came to honestly see that anything can be turned into a story, as long as you're looking at it from the right lens. No matter how boring you think it is. Very cool. That's that's super awesome. So really, anything can be a story. I like that. And then, and did you stumble upon that idea of that what if from Tyler Perry? And you said you implemented in this book. Is that true? No. So with. The Tyler Perry thing. I actually learned it recently. Where、okay. a part of me was thinking, well, he's one of the billionaires that doesn't get much love. Not many people talk about him. Like they talk about、uh, guys like Steven Spielberg,、uh, Quentin Tarantino, and you know Tyler Perry. If you think about it, is a one man army. He writes his own movies. He casts a lot of the characters. He's the business mind behind it. I was like, why doesn't he get as much love? And that was by strategy, because he never wanted to be one of these accepted guys in Hollywood. He wanted to do his own thing so he could innovate in the process. So he just got my curiosity recently, and I heard him, you know, giving that tip: "What if? What if? What if?" And I was thinking, "Huh, that's something very similar to what I've been doing." And you know how when someone gives you a certain insight that you've been doing,、yeah. but you personally thought you were the only one doing it, and this other person's like. Nope, I've been doing it too. That's when your mind becomes blown, and that was one of those situations with Tyler Perry. 
That's awesome. What's one of these stories that sticks out that you use that principle for? Are there any stories in here that stick out where it was like that what if technique helped you to come up with that story or helped you to find it and realize it? Yeah. So, I mean, one of them was, let me actually just go through it right now because there's uh, so many. Yeah. Um, well, one of them was the beloved hype man. Okay. And this is uh, a story about me going to Orlando, uh, which I thought was going to be a quick little trip. Uh, Tampa to Orlando normally takes an hour and a half. And this was a couple of years ago where I was supposed to go with my brother and my roommate at the time. Yeah. But, you know, I got called up at work and I, they ended up leaving early. So I was like, yeah, whatever. I'll just drive there and I could listen to some music. So as I'm driving there, what happens is there's this huge accident. And from that huge accident, I also noticed that you know, the, since the traffic is there, the internet is very slow. So I can't even scroll uh, the internet, do anything, play music. It's taking forever to buffer. So I'm just stuck in the road. It's silent and I'm just bored. And by the time that I get to the uh, party area in Orlando, I see that every parking spot is filled. Now I got to park 30 minutes away. No one's picking up their phone. I got to walk 40 plus minutes. I'm sweating. And by the time I actually get to the party, everyone's just like, yo, man, what took you so long? And no one can understand like the backstory of how much of a nightmare this trip was. But here's the thing. The guy whose birthday it was, the guy who's the star of the show for the night, was a person who was capable of seeing, huh, it took you very long. Whoa, it took you four hours to get here? What? And he was asking me a lot of questions, which you wouldn't expect the star of the show for the night to even bring up. And that was the beloved hype man. And one of the what if scenarios I was thinking was, what if I actually didn't have that driveway from hell? And what if I just had the routine level? I wouldn't be able to understand that this guy is the hype man. And then I was able to play off the story a lot within the Armani Talks brand, where I said that. If you want to be more charismatic, be a hype man. You take the pressure off of yourself and you're capable of making others feel more important. So it just wanted to show me that bad situations, if you look at the longer viewpoint, can turn into lessons in the future. So that was just one of those stories. That's awesome. I love that. I remember that story. It really stuck out to me. And I think it helped me make one of those 1% improvements where you see like it's not all about it's not all about me. You can look at what the other person's going through and what they went through or what they might need in that situation. So, yeah. Right, right. Because especially when you're the centerpiece for the night, you notice a lot of the macro level details, not the micro. But the hype man is capable of noticing the macro and the micro. Even though it was his birthday for the night, he was able to even put together, huh, this guy's from Tampa. It should have taken him an hour and a half, but it took him four hours wait a minute, he must have been stuck in traffic for a long time. And wait a minute, he said he parked in this neighborhood, which is very far away from where I am, which means that his phone battery is low or other people weren't picking up the phone. And he's making all these little micro connections in a split second. And that's something that hype man can do, that people who are like, how can I make other people like me simply cannot even perceive. And that's huge. That's a huge like paradigm shift in the way of thinking. Yeah. And before, I mean, I didn't even know that this guy was the hype man. I thought that this guy was just a regular kind of guy. Yeah. But in that situation, it was just a light bulb moment. And I'm like, wait, this is the beloved hype man that people normally talk about. And it was just the first time when this is a good friend of mine. Yeah. And this was the first time I was able to realize he is the hype man. Yeah. That's a huge thing. So if you want to sharpen your stories, first of all, ask what if, because that puts you in a situation, right? That long car ride and just having a horrible experience to see other people being like, okay, like just have fun, Armani, have a good time, <laughs> go out there, get them. But you notice that someone else was seeing it from a different level and you're saying like, hey man, like, you know, like he, he realized there was something going on. Yeah, I mean, and this is the power of storytelling where you can actually alter your past because if you could change your perception of the past, then it actually 
it changes your viewpoints regarding it. So if I never even thought about turning that moment into a story, I would have been like, hey, you remember a couple of years ago, I was stuck in traffic for so long. Man, I hate that moment. Yeah. But nowadays, you know, here I am having an interview with you in regards to it. So the past actually changed through storytelling. That's awesome. Very cool. I love that. So that's awesome. So a lot of great tips there on basically storytelling, but also how you can really get those gems and, and those important lessons from the past. If you, if you ask yourself that question, what if? What if? Um, next question here, Armani, I wanted to ask is, what unique insights did, did you get from writing the book? So what's something that you know now that you don't think you would have known if you had not written the book word book? Sure. So this may seem like a counterintuitive answer, yeah. but stick with me. Yeah. Writing a book is a very boring process. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you tell someone I wrote a book, immediately in their mind, they're thinking, wow, like you wrote a book and it's a glitz in the glam kind of thing especially someone who's thinking about writing their book for the first time. And that's one of the services I offer with my Armani Talks brand, where I work with different entrepreneurs from different industries and help them write their first book. And they're coming and they're thinking, man, this is going to be like one of those moments. It's going to be a glitz in the glam kind of thing. Yeah. But little do they realize that it's a process. And it's basically where you're waking up five to six in the morning. You're writing for hours and hours and hours. Your day is already done. You're looking out. You're like, what? Uh, the sun just rose. It, it's already uh, it's sinking right now. And it's going on like this for a couple of weeks to a couple of months and for certain authors for a couple of years. So one of the insights that I learned in regards to writing a book, in my opinion, it's one of the hardest things you can do because it requires you to think. And not just think for a small amount of time but think for an extended period of time where you have to show willpower. So regularly, people don't want to show willpower. And now you're saying that this person has to show willpower while thinking. Yes, writing a book is one of the hardest things. And that's one of the main insights that I was able to get out of it. Yeah, writing a book is a very tough thing to do. And you said you help people with writing books. What advice would you give to someone watching right now who feels they have a book and then they want to write, but hasn't been able to get the motivation or maybe doesn't have the routines or discipline to do it currently? Well, what I recommend is you start off light. You know, you don't necessarily just have to dive into the book from the very beginning stages. So when I'm working with a certain person who wants to write a book, the very first thing that we're doing is we're creating an outline. And with the outline, you just get a general gist of what's in this book. Okay. Is this going to be a short story book, an anthology book? Am I going to create a novel? Am I going to create a how-to book, a do-it-yourself kind of book? You start to brainstorm rather than just diving in from the very get-go. So you're starting off in the three-foot side of the pool versus the six-foot side, and you can't even swim. So that's what I would recommend for people who are thinking about writing their first book. Start off with a general outline. If I were to say, hey, uh, just give me the potential chapters, which would be in the book. You don't even have to write any of the content. Give me the skeleton. Be able to at least do that. And if you can't even do that, then you have no business writing a book in the first place because that's the easy part. Okay. Very cool. So writing a book, it's tough. And the reason why is because it combines willpower with thinking, which are two tough things to do nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who was it? Henry, Henry Ford? I think he had the quote, uh, thinking is the hardest task you can do. That's why so few people do it. And that's all writing is. You're thinking out loud. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. And very. I wanted to see the next question I have here is, well, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but I wanted to ask, like, who specifically should purchase your book, Wordplay? Like, who was it written for? Who did you have in mind when you, were, when you first started writing it? So... I had two groups in mind, and this is the type of groups that my business normally appeals to is entrepreneurs and engineers. Yeah. Entrepreneurs are normally the very artistic sort of individuals. Engineers are the very technical sorts of individuals. So this book is written in a very creative way where your imagination will get involved. Plus, it's written in a very technical way 
where you're going to get certain formulas and frameworks which will appeal to you. And normally, you know, in a field like communication skills, it's very easy to get a little whimsical uh, where you're saying, yeah, you could do it. And everything is, is a little too fluffy. So I wanted this book to not only get you amped up, get your emotions involved, but I want the reader to get frameworks and tools, processes that they can mimic in real world situations. So typically this book is going to resonate with you if you're an entrepreneur and engineer or an adult with a busy lifestyle as a whole that wants to start learning and improving your communication. Yeah. Awesome. I was curious when I first picked up this book because I it's a it's a bunch of, it's a lot of short stories, right? And this, was there a certain formula that went into choosing the order of the stories? Like, did you think about that? Because so if you said it could be a choose your own adventure and I'm the type where I just started from beginning to end. That's the way I like to read. Yeah. <laughs> maybe break out of that shell, but how did you choose the order to put the stories in? So there was actually no order. I, I created it where it was completely unordered. Oh, and okay. I, I like how you said you read it from beginning to end because different people come to me and they'll be like, I read it from beginning to end. And some people will be like, man, I started from backwards to beginning just to see how unordered it really was. So it, it's funny uh, talking to the readers because everyone reads it in a different way. And that was the main uh, point of the book where ha have you watched the show Black Mirror? I have. Yeah, I love that show. Yeah, you know how you could technically watch uh, what's one of them? The White Christmas yeah. first, and then you could watch the first ever episode that they made. And yeah. it's not like, oh, whoa, I'm missing something. And that was the vibe that I was going for. So it, it's designed to be unord unordered. That's cool. That's very, that's awesome. And I never thought about that. So I remember reading the first one and I was thinking like, he probably chose this to be the first one for some reason. I remember thinking that. So I was making <laughs> Good question. Awesome. And we mentioned the beloved hype man. That was, I think one of my favorites. That was a really good one, but what was your favorite story or essay? Or what are some of your favorite stories or essays that you've done this book? I would say one of my favorite ones was Words and Money. I don't know if you got that far yet, so I don't want to ruin it for you. Uh, but let me just share it. So Words and Money was a very influential moment for me. And this happened when I was in high school, where there was this one drug dealer who had most of the business. And... I used to be one of those individuals who wanted to get rich, you know, and I thought I stumbled onto the perfect business model. And this is where I would get blank CDs. I would put songs on the CDs and I would sell it. And at that time, no one was doing this. So I was making a lot of money in high school and I felt like one of the cool kids. I was eating the good lunch. But eventually what started to happen was different people heard about this business. They started partnering up with one another. And they started to run their own business. Back then, I was this very quiet kid. I didn't know how to form connections like that. And just like that, I was run out of business. And what I came to notice was normally after school, I would play basketball. And there was this one drug dealer. I believe his name was Omar, who would always have the most business. And I would think... Why is this? I mean, there's so many different drug dealers in this particular high school. Why is it that everyone comes to him? And it just so happened that he was sitting next to me one day and we started to talk. And he gave me a very influential lesson. He said, it's because in my worldview, I'm not chasing the money first. I'm going out of my way to give the best drugs and the money follows while all these other people, they try to go for the money first. And then he pulled out a $100 bill and he ripped it into tiny little pieces. And I was a high school kid. I, for me, this was like burning $10,000 raw. I was like, man, what is this idiot doing? And I just couldn't perceive the lesson in high school. But by the time I got into Toastmasters and I did a few speeches, I got this one mentee. He was this dorky Indian kid. I think his name was Prashant. And as he was practicing in front of me, he was using these very colorful words, right? Super colorful. And I had no clue what he was saying. He was talking in circles. 
And I'm like, bro, strip it down. I don't know what value you're trying to give me. And he's like, no, 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 no. I got to use the right words. Otherwise, these people won't like me. And this is when Omar's lesson from a couple of years before was starting to make sense. It's not the words that necessarily matter. It's the value that you're trying to give. If you try to give value first, then the words will come. And likewise with Omar, since he was giving the value to his market, the money was coming. So that's what words and money started to have that connection. That was the essence of that particular story. That is huge. I, I had not gotten that far. That sounds like a very powerful story. And it just goes to show what you were saying earlier. You can take lessons from anything, right? Like you think like, what am I going to learn from a drug dealer? I could see someone being prideful and be like, what am I going to learn from a drug dealer? Yeah. That's- and <laughs> and the thing is, w- what's great about storytelling is that you can merge different parts of your life together. Yeah. Where when I was learning from the drug dealer, this yeah. is when I was in 11th grade. Yeah. And when I was learning from Prashant, this is probably a decade later, but somehow I was able to make that connection where one party, uh, all their focus was on the money. That's what they were losing out to people like Omar and with guys like Prashant, their focus was so much on the words that they weren't understanding that it's the value that the audience wants. How are you making their life just a little bit better than it was before? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like a, it's a, it's one of those shifts, right? It's one of those like paradigm shifts where you realize it's not about what I say at all. It's, uh, it's about the value that I give to people, what they get from the fact that I'm there. Right? Absolutely, it's yeah. like let's say you're, you're a financial planner, right? Yes. And uh, let's say I'm over here talking about calculus three for engineers, and I'm just talking to you. I'm using all the right words you're not going to be able to perceive any value because that has no relevance to you in your life unless you need some calculus for financial planning. But for the most part, that doesn't matter. So the words come secondary in communication skills, which takes so long to learn because in the beginning of our conversation, I was talking about how in school, predominantly, we were rewarded for the correct words that we were using, how colorful language that we could do. But in real world communication, it's mainly about unlearning. It's about being real and becoming value centered first. I, I, they, there was a story in here on unlearning, right? Is that something that you talk about in this book? The idea of unlearning? Yes. You learn with your head, you unlearn with your heart. And the reason why is because unlearning is way harder than learning because pride is involved, uh, emotions are involved. And that's where tension happens, where you'll see a lot of individuals who are veterans in certain fields. And you'll notice that you would expect these veterans to thrive when certain changes are made, but they're, they dig their heels, you know, deeper into the ground. This is how we used to do it. How come we're not doing it like this anymore? It's because now they have to unlearn what they were taught for so many years. So unlearning is nowadays probably just as important as learning and then relearning is the third step yeah i had a a few questions here that you're bringing up during this um during what you said recently so this story i love that story i can't wait to read it i'm probably gonna read it right after this and how you seem like you're gifted at making these connections right like this is a story this is someone ripping up a hundred dollar bill which i could see would be an emotionally charged thing to see as an 11th grader right as a what uh, joseph oh pardon me so you're, I'm talking about the words and money, the story. Uh-huh. You used to have this two things that seem very unrelated, right? And you're able to make that connection. And it seems like you're gifted at doing that. So you have like him ripping up a hundred dollar bill, the drug right. dealer, and then someone else practicing a speech and they're just using a lot of languages. It's like, wherefore art thou Romeo, right? And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's um, exactly how he was sounding. <laughs> how do you make that how do you get good at making those connections? Because that seems like that's very much rooted in your success as a storyteller, as an author. How do you make those connections? Like, What is the the secret sauce to that? So the secret sauce is, and this may be a little controversial, but here it goes. There's this quote that floats around a lot. uh, There's no such thing as a new idea. And people, you know, treat this idea sort of like a deity. Like there's no such thing as a new idea, okay? Where I think, Sure, there's no such thing as a new insight, 
the end product, but that's not what I'm curious about. What I'm curious about is how we got to that insight. So for example, me saying uh, words are secondary in communication is value number one. Mm-hmm. I'm sure many people 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, thought of that same insight, the idea. But once again, that's not what I'm focused on. You could just Google that part. What I'm really curious about is what led up to that moment. And when a person makes that little shift where they're more curious about what led up to that moment, it's as though their mindset opens up and now they're capable of introspecting. They're capable of problem solving, doing some strategic reflection skills that people who are like, well, there's no such thing as a new idea are never going to be able to understand. And what's very dangerous about you know, someone saying there's no such thing as a new idea is that nowadays, you know, you go on social media, you go on a lot of YouTube channels, they reward you for how much you can sound like other people. Like we were talking about TubeBuddy before this um, call. And TubeBuddy is a YouTube uh, search engine tool where you could research certain keywords. I don't know if you have the paid version, but for the paid version, as soon as you click it, the first thing that comes up is the trending topics. And people who are very hungry for views are going to be like, yeah, everyone's talking about this. That means I need to talk about it. Where if you want to make these different connections from different parts of your life, you have to sort of be a black sheep. You got to be a little bit more different than other people. And you got to go with the idea that I don't really care if all these ideas have been created before. They haven't been reached through my certain levels of experiences because, you know, people are always like, "Uh, did you know that two thumbprints are not the same? No two thumbprints are the same. They're very happy about that. But then again, no two experiences are the same. So by simply factoring in your experiences, you are capable of completely unique content. And that's what motivates me as a storyteller, creating unique content that you're not going to find anywhere else. Words and money is something that you're only going to find in wordplay. You're not going to find it in Google or any search engines. That's what motivates me. And that's how I think you're going to make connections from different parts of your life by factoring in your experiences. Yeah. And that's such a huge point. So yes, the idea of words are secondary may have been. So people may have had that idea before, but that experience of your life, no one has had that experience, right? No one has had the exact same life as our money talks. Right. And th- absolutely. And that's where a little bit of Seinfeld was inspired, uh, the show Seinfeld, where I wanted to really turn real world experiences uh, where people normally can't see anything, but I'm capable of seeing something because I actually went through it and then creating lessons and insights for different people where they can see a little bit of themselves in that story, which allows for a perspective shift. I mean, I could be, you know, giving you a lecture on YouTube or whatever, just giving you a very formal lecture that we had in school. But I don't think that's as impactful as hearing the short story or just reading it. Yeah. That story sounds amazing. I cannot wait to read it. It sounds like really cool. Do you find that you've gotten better at that over time, like making those connections? Is it something like that you've gotten better at since you've started your content creation journey? Or is it something that um, you've always had? No, I would say I've definitely gotten a lot better where nowadays I actually came to realize that it makes me a little bit more patient where, you know, earlier when we were talking about the beloved hype man, the mere idea of being stuck in traffic, uh, I hate, you know, cold weather and traffic, I used to hate. But after gaining that lesson from that one moment, nowadays, if I'm stuck in traffic, I'm like, huh, maybe two to three years from now, this can actually make for a certain story. And this story I could put into a book, it can create passive income. And now it's getting me to mature a little bit more. But the biggest part, Joseph, is that the more ideas that you get, the more ideas that you get. And what that basically means is that you always want to have an abundance mindset towards ideas. That's why, you know, Twitter, YouTube, podcast, I give away a lot of stuff for free just to, you know, keep conditioning that abundance mindset in my worldview, which allows me to see more connections. Because if I'm like, oh, no, no, I got to hold on to this. I'm basically subconsciously being like, 
your money. You're not going to be able to make any more connections. So hold on to this for dear life. While on the flip side, if I'm like, no, I mean, these ideas are infinite. And which ideas are? They're infinite. There's no end to this. That's when you start to really become a storyteller who could connect different concepts. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that. One belief will lead you totally in the wrong direction, right? You hold on to that idea. The idea is going to become obsolete. It's going to be like... When yes, you're sharing, it creates more opportunities. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what the whole learning, unlearning, relearning thing is about. Yeah. Each time we're doing that, each time we're getting a little bit closer to abundance mindset. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. And one other thing that you said that struck me was this idea of the, and it's in, it's in the book too. I remember reading it, this idea that every fingerprint, we're all very proud of the fact we have different fingerprints but we all think we have like the exact same nervous system <laughs> and we see the world the exact same way. And something that's important to you will be important to me too. And we're all the same, but that's definitely not true. Like why would we have the same nervous system? It doesn't make sense. So I just thought that was something also that kind of changed my way of thinking. Like someone may not like the joke that I say, but it's not because it's not funny or maybe it isn't funny if everyone doesn't like it, but it kind of gets you thinking on a different level. So. Absolutely. In my YouTube channel, there's this one YouTube video called, the five lessons. And basically the summary of the YouTube video is where I talk about five lessons that I learned from my parents when I first came to the U S and here's the beauty about being a speaker at an event. You feel like a little celebrity uh, in that event where after you're done giving the talk, different people come to you and they're like, uh, wow, what an amazing job. This is why I like the talk. This is why I liked it. And they're all giving you different reasons. And in this particular audience, most of the members were from overseas, okay? And since they were from overseas, they were really able to resonate with me being from overseas coming to the U.S. They're like, I connected with your story. Like, I felt it, right? But then one of the people who was, I believe, the owner of that particular location, uh, she was a white woman who lived in U.S. her entire life. Yeah. So when she came to me, she's like, yo, thanks a lot for sharing the story. I actually had no clue what it's like to be a person from overseas. So she perceived the same exact speech in a completely different way than the people who are from overseas. So it just shows you that uh, different lessons, content are interpreted in different ways. Yeah. So it's possible you've put a story in here that would give someone an insight that you have not even had yet, which is also kind of a cool idea, kind of a little trippy. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was actually having this podcast with Life Math Money recently, yeah, and he was asking me during our podcast, what was uh, a story that I enjoyed? And I talked about the Tuna Man story, yeah. and I told him my perception regarding it. And then in that interview, he's like, huh, I actually got a different perception regarding it. And that was the intention where different people get their own insights from it because they're viewing the stories from their experiences. That's awesome. That's kind of a, it kind of shows the power of a book as a medium. Storytelling for sure is huge in that way. Um, Wanted to move on here to ask you if there's any future plans that you have when it comes to the short short story series, Any, any future plans in that area. Absolutely. So the 101 short stories, essays, and insights to improve communication skills, I plan to make it an unordered series. Sort of like, have you ever read Goosebumps? Yes. So you don't necessarily need to read book one of Goosebumps to read book 50, right? So that's an unordered series. So I plan to release more 101 short stories under this title in the near future. Uh, The next one up is Street Smarts, followed by Limit Breaker, followed by Tough Love. So there's much more short stories coming along the way, but Wordplay was the first one to get started. That's cool. I, those names are intriguing to me. Street Smarts, what is like the theme? What is the idea behind Street Smarts? You don't mind sharing. Sure. So Street Smarts is to show you that a lot of these boundaries that we think exist aren't actually real all the time, where people with Street Smarts can perceive that. And I'll just give you a little preview for the book. Uh, A couple of years back, I was living in Virginia and I was living in this pretty big mansion because uh, my company uh, had this little boarding house where a lot of people would get trained 
before they looked for their own apartments. So I was, as I was living in this mansion, there was this dog that stayed with us. I believe there were 10 other roommates or so. And one day, this beloved dog, everyone loved it, by the way, I got extremely sick, was throwing up, just was not feeling well. So we took the dog to the vet. And this vet was this rude man who was charging us this extremely high price. And, you know, for us, we were just starting this job. We weren't getting money like that. We just couldn't pay. So it was looking like we had to put the dog to sleep. So as we're about to, you know, make peace with the dog being put to sleep, the nurse uh, or whoever just that was standing right next to the vet was this quiet lady that was listening to everything. And as I'm about to go to the parking lot to make sure that my car didn't get towed, she comes to me and she's like, hey, how much money can you pay? Just curious. And she's just talking to me. She's not talking to everyone else because you could just tell by her body language that she's thinking about helping me in some way. And I don't want to spoil it, but I just wanted to give you a little peek, which helped me spot, yo, this lady's actually looking out for me where a person with streets without street smarts just wouldn't be able to perceive it where when the vet gave that final price for, Hey, this is how much it is in their mind that is filled with boundaries. They're going to be like, all right, I guess this is just how much it is. But in this real world that we live in, there's always these pockets of people that try to help you out in some way. Every now and then people get a little pessimistic where they're like, well, there's a lot of people that are trying to, uh, hinder me that are trying to destroy me sure people like that exist but still there's that one person that's always trying to help you out and the essence of street smarts is to give you these short stories to help you look beyond the boundaries look beyond those boundaries of sort of like giving up right because you think it's over at that point in time when the vet says that you're like always a vet he said it it's done that's it but you don't see the 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 possibilities that there are yeah and especially as someone that who is not speaking too much she's observing she's taking notes i don't know if you've ever been to a vet but there's always the vet and the assistant yeah so a mind that has so much boundaries and rules just cannot think huh this assistant may be able to create a deal that the vet will be influenced by yeah. You see, so yeah. a mind that is focused on street smarts, which is communication skills. You know, yeah. when people are like, well, what is soft skills? I don't necessarily know what that is. Yeah, It's street smarts. It's the ability to deal with people, ability to control yourself and create opportunities for yourself. So that's the theme of street smarts. And those are the stories that are geared towards that theme. Very cool. Another one that caught my eye here is tough love. I always like to think tough love is rooted in the truth and the fact that the truth is always good, even if it's something you don't want to face. Yeah, so tough love. I mean, the essence of that is to set your heart on fire. And you'll you'll love the book cover where it's very unusual. It's, it's actually a heart set on fire. And the reason that you want to set your heart on fire, what that means in a very symbolic sense is that a lot of people are fearful And that's just how humans are conditioned for survival reasons. But when you have that burning why, that's what helps you navigate towards uh, fearlessness. That's what self-improvement and just improving as a person is set for. And you're never going to find that level of improvement, that level of fearlessness, if you're not giving tough love to yourself. Sure, other people can give tough love to you. That may help you out. But the essence of that book is to first give tough love to yourself. And the short stories within that book all fit under that particular theme. Yeah, that's cool. I really like that. So this is kind of the original, right? The wordplay, not the original, but like the template. And now you're going to like build on it with different themes, like more focused. And it sounds like these are going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, plenty of uh, short stories, insights. Uh, most of them are within the 1000 word range. So it doesn't take too long to read. And ultimately, the whole purpose of the 101 short stories, essays, and insights to improve communication skills is just that, to improve communication skills and to help you learn beyond just the boring traditional lectures. Yeah. 
But I mean, you think about how powerful that is, though. It's like you're breaking down with street smarts, you're breaking down boundaries and rigidity that's in your mind and seeing possibilities you can never see. Like that could change people's lives. Absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what the entire purpose of these books are, where once you are capable of getting it in, my type of teaching is where I want to teach without them having a clue. And that's when you ever heard of the thing called uh, people hate to be sold to, but they love to buy. Yep. Well, people love to learn. But they hate to know that they're learning. You see? So that's my writing style. That's why I like to keep it super simple. And a lot of the times, I mean, the stories are up to interpretation. I don't give you a moral. I let you uh, figure out the moral for yourself. And that's what keeps you consistently curious. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And I wanted to ask a few wrap up questions here, but is there anything else you wanted to say on the, the topic of your book wordplay? And I'll ask a few questions about it, but is there anything else that, that we missed that you have to cover? I think you did a good job. Uh, and just to even add on to that even more, yeah, it's, it's a book where I believe it's needed, where there are tons of stories for children and there's not enough sh- stories for adults. So this is going to be one of those um, short stories that adults can read, where if you go on Amazon, most of the short story books for adults are super erotic. <laughs> it's one of those um, super XXX ones. But this one's it's very practical to your day to day life. So yeah. it's, it's taking on the topic of short stories, anthologies from a completely different realm. Yeah. And I can definitely vouch for that. You know, I've been reading this book and so many ideas in here that if you take the time to implement them in your life, will change the way, first of all, you see the world in a positive way. So it'll, it'll create more opportunities, like little things like the beloved hype man. I remember reading that and I was like, hey, I want to be a hype man. Like I was thinking like, I want to be like the DJ type of guy, right? Um, yeah. And I started thinking when I was having interactions with people, like how can I, how can I help this person and think about what, what they need instead of just focusing on myself. It changes the way I interact. Go ahead. Sorry. No, absolutely. And, and just the way that the world is wired, it's like when you create enough value for others, whether they're aware of it or not, they try to create some value for you as well. It just, yeah. people aren't sometimes patient enough to notice that where they're like, well, I gave a little bit of value. I don't recall getting a little bit of value back. You just got to be patient and look at the longer picture. So yeah. I'm glad that particular story ended up helping you see the world in a different way. Yeah. I like that. that. It takes that patience. And I wanted to ask a final question here. I usually ask, I'm not going to ask the same question I asked last time. So I'm going to make one up here, play some jazz. Um, <laughs> when it comes to, I want it to be related to this book. What's an idea about unlearning that's in this book? that you would want to say, if you could only say one idea that people should unlearn or need to unlearn that from our uh, education, the way the way our education system is or their lives, what is one idea about unlearning that you would want people to, to know that's in this book? Well, one of them, Joseph, is competition mindset versus creation mindset, where you'll often notice that people of power try to push the, you know, compete, compete, compete mindset a lot, which worked very well in the industrial age where, you know, since we were predominantly focusing on physical resources, yeah, I mean, having some competition mindset to you is great. But nowadays, unless you're some sort of athlete who's getting paid to compete or you're a politician who's trying to win an election, you really got to unlearn that key idea and center your lifestyle around creation mindset where no one has to lose for you to win. That's what the information age is gearing us towards example this right here Uh, as we're over here working with one another you're asking me questions i'm answering we're having a conversation you're not losing i'm not losing either you see synergy is being created and as other people uh, let's say even two people watch this right as they watch it they're not losing either no one's making you watch this and that's where multiple parties are capable of winning So with wordplay, I wanted to every now and then bring up that key idea where you don't want to be competing so much, where you're kind of constantly looking around you, uh, being a very fearful individual. Nowadays, it's the era of learning the information age, learning to create win-win situations 
or win-win-win situations for all parties involved. Yeah, it's almost the way of the future. I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing once you notice it. I, have you ever read the book, The 48 Laws of Power? I haven't read it. Uh, I've been uh, um, recommended it. Is it good? It's good, but it kind of, I was reading it recently and it kind of gets you into that opposite, that competition mindset. <laughs> a little yeah, bit. Uh, yeah well, definitely with Robert Greene. Um, I haven't really read his work, but I see different people quote it. And uh, I mean, it's definitely a different philosophy uh, as a whole. Yeah, but I like this because it's true. And nowadays there's so many opportunities for creativity, for finding win-win situations, even just in negotiation. Like people always want to negotiate a certain way, right? Like I'll give you nothing and you'll give me everything <laughs> and it's like no that's not the way the world works anymore like, no we gotta find something you know yeah and it's one of those situations where you may get a short-term win yeah. but the subconscious mind doesn't lie i mean overall you're leaving a bad taste in someone's mouth so let me say for example i'm like uh joseph uh, somehow like somehow some way i'm like you need to pay to interview me on this book and somehow after doing a lot of strong armed uh, tactics, you're like, all right, you know, you're not really winning in any way. You're basically paying me. I'm getting the interview. I'm putting it on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Now, even though this may work in a very short term case, I technically won in the long term. I didn't win because let's say once I get a uh, tough love coming out and I'm like, Man, I like that Joseph guy. He asks very insightful questions. And I'm like, Hey, Joseph, um, you want to do another interview? You're like, and no, I'm not going to do it with you. Uh, you charged me last time. So what seems like a win now, when you have the hindsight of the bigger picture, it's not always a win. So you got to look at the bigger picture, the bigger system. And this is just, um, this is my engineering background sneaking in where you wouldn't imagine that this is an engineering insight. But nowadays, systems engineering is the biggest thing. And with systems engineering, the goal is to see how all the parts fit the entire system. So rather than just focusing on yourself, the part, you want to focus on the entire system. Yeah, which is you and everyone else around you that you're impacting. That absolutely, correct? absolutely. And you can't do that if you're just kind of looking out for yourself and you don't really care if other people win in the process. You got to actually be strategic. Let them win in the process. So you create a tension-free zone for now you to win. This yeah. is the best long-term thinking out there. I was thinking about this with friends and people I know who part sell or people who've sold me something that I really didn't feel good about buying. <laughs> I don't know if yeah. you're in that position, but I used to have like that issue where I had trouble saying no. And sometimes I would buy stuff and I'll be like, I don't ever want to talk to that person again. Like, it was pretty much like they were dead to me after I bought it. <laughs> it was like yeah. <laughs> because they didn't really give you something of value like yeah. that you could use in your life. If you could use it in your life, then it's a win-win and this person should sell it to you. But if it's just, they're trying to fill their pockets, it's not going to work in the long term. And it's so easy to see nowadays. It's like, you can feel it almost. It's like a, it's an instinct. <laughs> uh, very cool. And I wanted to ask you one more question that kind of popped in my mind and feel free to answer it or not, if you want to. You sure. talk about our industrial age education system. If Armani talks were to design an educational system, like how would it be different? How would you how would you design a school to teach the, the skills that you, you talk about? Excellent. So my philosophy is very different from formal education, where in formal education, we got the theory first, we got tests, and practice was optional. My philosophy is different. I believe that you should get a little theory just to get started, then you should focus on practice, whatever the practice may be for whatever institution. And that should be the main paradigm. So a little theory and focus on the practical education. Now, to give you an example, uh, for engineering students, for example, we had for the first two to three years, a theory regarding how a capacitor worked, how a battery worked, how a diode work for the longest time these concepts just were not tangible for us but by year four we started to take the labs and as soon as we started to take the labs we started to actually see how to use these parts to create a radio something of practical use in the world with my philosophy i would recommend flipping that have three years of labs with a little bit of theory sprinkled in and the more that you can do that 
the more that you can find the right theory, which resonates to problem solve. Just learning theory for the sake of learning theory, it does nothing. But if you are learning theory with the intention to problem solve, now things are winning. So to answer your question, I mean, it really comes down to reversing what we currently have from theory predominant to practice predominant. And you sprinkle in theory as a complement rather than the full entree. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. And I wanted to ask if there's anything else you'd like to say um, regarding your book or anything else you'd like to, to say, Armand. Sure. Uh, Wordplay is currently out on Amazon. And it's one of those books where, you know, you got to read it once and then you could play around with it. And once you read it, uh, be sure to leave me a review, uh, letting me know your honest thoughts. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, we also have it in the description. You can check that out. And highly recommend it. It's such a great book. So many great ideas. And it's really easy to get into. It's uh, this kind of idea if you make it real easy to learn the skills that will basically level up your communication skills. So that's something very powerful, I think. It was powerful for me when, I was, when I've been reading it. So. Thank you, Joseph. Of course. And let me see here. Live stream. And thank you for watching, everybody. We'll catch you on the next one.